right, thank you all for coming in today. Um, great to have you for the second for Pride, um, focusing on queer figures in portraiture. Um, a couple of notes technologically. So um, for all, for everyone who is joining us who isn't a uh, presenter, please keep yourselves on mute unless you have any questions and feel free to put yourself on video or off of video, whatever you see fit. If you do have any questions throughout the, um, throughout the presentation, feel free to put it within the chat and we'll get to it within the last 15 minutes of the presentation. Um, if there aren't any questions to start off with, um, I'll kick it off to Tracy to give an introduction. Okay, um, thank you everybody for coming today. I'm Tracy Crum and I'm the uh, Director for Artistic Advancement at the Textile Center and we're really thrilled to be hosting our, I think this is our fourth Art Speaks um, lunchtime Zoom session. Uh, bringing back a number of the artists um, from the Pride exhibition to do a second discussion today. So thank you all for coming. Um, I'm just gonna give a real brief introduction to the four artists who will be joining us today. We have Rebecca Levi um, from Brooklyn, New York. We have Aubrey Longley Cook from Los Angeles, California. We have Gregory T. Wilkins from Mankato, Minnesota. And we have Michael Sylvan Robinson, also from Brooklyn, New York. So we wanna welcome you from near and far and um, really look forward to the conversation. We will be taking questions in the chat room from anyone in the audience who has a question. And then I will help facilitate um, some question and answer time at the end uh, to get your uh, questions addressed. So thank you everybody and uh, We'll go ahead and get started. Thank you, Ray. Yeah, thanks, Tracy. Yeah, to kick it off, I wanted to go and uh, go ahead and talk with each artist and pretty much give you the floor and uh, give us a um, synopsis of your work. Tell us about yourselves and uh, where you at, uh, where you are at creatively. We'll start with Rebecca. Oh, Rebecca, you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Rebecca Levy. Uh, I'm an embroidery artist. And uh, my pieces in the show are represented in the image that's up on your screen. In the bottom left corner, you'll see some wrestling girls. Um, that's um, it's an em embroidery art. And um, yeah, where, where should we get started, Ray? Oh, you can just tell us a little bit about um, what your work is about overall, or the pieces specifically in the show, whatever works best for you. Great. So I think almost all of my art is uh, representational art that does uh, engage portraiture. Um, the body, I would say these days, yeah, the body or the face. Um, this particular series is based on um, romance comics from the 50s and 60s. Uh, so a lot of my art uh, came out of an interest in collecting ephemera from other eras. Um, at flea markets, at um, thrift stores, at Goodwills. And I had purchased, um, had found these romance comics um, back in uh, the, the the other image um, that you had just seen was based on a romance comic. These are based on pinups that I had a long period of time collecting uh, female pinup um, pinups from different eras at um, at flea markets around New York and Provincetown, and when I travel. Uh, and in fact, my whole engagement with visual art came out of collecting. Like I wasn't doing anything with the images. I wasn't drawing, I wasn't doing embroidery with them. I was just interested in them and figuring out how to engage with them artistically. Um, earlier on, I was a performance artist, so I didn't know what I was gonna do with them. Was I gonna put them in a performance piece? I wasn't sure. Um, so eventually I started drawing them and then I started um, uh, embroidering them after that. Um, the wrestling girls, uh, I think I had a particular fascination with, um, you know, imagery of that era of two women together. Um, it's not explicitly queer. It's not done in a queer context. It's absolutely produced for male gaze. But I think us, uh, in, we in the queer community, 
um, when you're coming out, when things are early on, um, you're looking, I mean, now it's different with the internet, but for um, those of us who came out earlier uh, in the 20th century, you know, you're looking for things in between the lines. And um, sometimes you find things that weren't meant for a queer audience and you find a queer theme in them and they take on a certain fascination and maybe draw you uh, along your path of coming out and knowing yourself and your desire. So I feel like the wrestling girls, they're super awkward poses. It's, it's not even clear that um, these women know each other. Um, I think they're kind of like the, the things that are scratched off on the contact paper uh, and rejected, perhaps even. They're, they're just very awkward, um, but also super beautiful. Um, and I wanted to capture those kind of quasi-queer moments uh, in between these two models. Um, the second one there is the back of the embroidery piece. Um, so it's really, when you see it in person or close up, it's, uh, it's really messy. You know, it's showing, it's showing the leftover thread, the, the reverse side. And I also thought that showed, uh, conveyed uh, more of the drama of the interaction um, of the two women. So um, that's kind of a snapshot of, of those pieces. I, I'd say uh, over time, you know, with the disappearance of those source material places like flea markets, um, aren't there like zero in New York City now? Like you cannot put your hand on a piece of found photography in New York if you tried. Um, you know, things obviously ported over to the internet. And so a lot of my series for a a few years was from uh, Gay Men on Tumblr, um, which was called 100 Tumblr Bears Can't Be Wrong. Uh, then Tumblr, you know, banned porn. And then uh, out of necessity, uh, a lot of my stuff is more of my original photography, <laughs> but that goes back and forth. Um, so that's, that's some insights there. Yeah, that's perfect. Cause I was gonna ask you with COVID-19 and everything going on with whether or not your source material has changed to go more digital and finding things on Tumblr. I saw that on your on your website too. And um, has that been amped up? You said that's pretty much, you need a certain type of imagery though. So what was it again that you find your source material? Perhaps? Well, I, I was doing for a few years um, for, for exploring the bare body, I was getting images from Tumblr and I didn't know those people, like they were, uh, I, I didn't know them. Uh, I would say the biggest trend, even though I'm still using um, source material from the internet, it's now more on Instagram. Sometimes, not always, sometimes I'll have an interaction with those people uh, and say, hey, I really like this. Do you have any poses that look like this that I would be able to use? Um, so sometimes there's more of a, of a dialogue around it. Um, but, you know, interestingly, we, we have even though we're now in COVID times and quarantine times, people were been taking, like all of those pictures are in people's bedrooms. They were doing it even when they had access to the outside world. Um, so in some ways those things haven't changed too much. Um, thematically, I am trying, I am starting to explore some of the quarantine um, themes. So um, I just did a piece on hand washing uh, and I'd like to continue some other themes like that. Um, one thing I, I always was doing was uh, found was working from photography. Uh, I'm working on a piece that's more based on a live drawing session that is totally a quarantine thing, like a live Zoom session um, where I took a sketch and I'm drawing that sketch. So that wouldn't have happened except for quarantine. So I'm sort of like a gentle touch in, in uh, exploring some quarantine Absolutely. Kind of have to just slowly ease into it, you know, with everything emotionally going on. Um, let's jump over to Michael or Sylvan, excuse me. Tell us a little bit about your work, if you will. Sure. Uh, I'm Sylvan. I, I describe myself as uh, working as a contemporary fiber artist. Uh, my media is really textile collage, uh, and I work in a sculptural garment form. I was originally a costume designer and uh, realized I didn't actually like being responsible for dressing actors. Uh, that I, uh, so I stopped making things that were wearable and then I had, I had more um, 
more autonomy and agency in what kind of garments I made. I have started actually returning to making some sculptural wearable garments, uh, but I primarily work in a kind of a doll size or small sized garment. Uh, and um, it's kind of a mix of uh, textile collage, uh, street art, protest culture. So there's, there's almost always a use of text. Um, uh, and, then a, and then a collage of both um, precious uh, fabric materials and irreverent use of them. So I, you know, I might buy a small snippet of very expensive lace, uh, but run, run it over and over again through the sewing machine in a way that is not a precious treatment of it. Um, you know, my work is very activist focused. And so uh, this year in particular, I've really um, been thinking a lot about uh, queer ancestors of liberation, uh, the ways that progress is made, uh, the, the messages and uh, repeated slogans and, and, and um, call to action. Uh, I will say that my original inspiration for my current style uh, is a very, very famous uh, uh, jacket made by an artist, Agnes Richter, uh, in Germany in the 1800s. She was institutionalized and she hand embroidered her story both on the outside of the reworked uniform and on the inside. Uh, and I saw the image when I was in grad school and did some research around it. And I have made similar garments ever since. So she is 100% sort of my, uh, my artist ancestor for this work. And I think a lot about uh, what it would have been, what it would have taken for a woman in those circumstances in that time to continue to hold on to her own story, her own agency, to uh, not allow her words to be taken away from her, uh, the craft and skill that must have gone into that, that garment that she wore and, um, and, and helped her hold on to herself. Of course, those are my interpretations of, of, of the uh, documentation. I mean, it's kind of amazing that we know her, right? That partially the, the brilliance of her craft is partially uh, why we know her name and, and her, a bit of her story because this garment exists today. Um, I think uh, the piece that I made specific for the Pride Show is the uh, love letter to queer descendants. I've been thinking a lot as a, as a midlife uh, queer activist from an ACT UP and Queer Nation era a survivor of, of the AIDS crisis peak years in New York. I'm thinking a lot about uh, generational responsibility, um, sometimes also the kind of the haunted trauma of my generation uh, that I, I, you know, I talk to 30 year olds who don't have any of the same reference points, even if they're queer guys, uh, that, that my entire circle of loved ones and friends encounter during that era. Uh, and I'm thinking a lot about the responsibilities of making sure that um, that I'm a good elder in the world as well. So I think that's pretty much the work that I, I call this series um, uh, Protective Wear for Urban Fairies. Uh, and I think a lot about the fact that these garments, I did a whole street art installation of them out in Bushwick when I first moved back to Brooklyn uh, that lasted up you know, in, in barbed wire and places in the city for, for months. Uh, I didn't actually have any taken down, which I thought was pretty, pretty great. Um, but I thought about the idea of like the people who are missing or the presences of stories. Uh, I like that, uh, that word ephemeral that Rebecca mentioned. I think there's a place where um, what's missing is marked on the surface of my garment sometimes or on the inside. And uh, yeah, I think that's a good, a good introduction to me. Yeah, thank you for, for mentioning everything. For the viewers who haven't gone to Sylvan's website, I recommend it because there's also this really fantastic mood board, which I think completely is going, and is it your Instagram account? Yeah, yeah, I have a good, I have a, I have a good Instagram account too, I'll admit. Um, I'm a social media uh, a fan. And, and, I, and I also think it's a way to sort of be, we were talking about this before the panel started, it's a way to engage with other artists and to share the conversation across, uh, our, our connections and distance. Absolutely. Um, let's jump over to, sorry, forgive me one second. Let's jump to Greg. Tell us a little, about, a little bit about yourself and your work. I, uh, I was born in Chicago and I moved when I was nine years old from the urban center 
to a small town in Florida. And I was raised in a multi-ethnic, multinational family. I'm one of seven children and I'm also a twin. And our family um, was faced with adversity um, that shaped my development and social activism and education. I have an African-American brother, an Asian brother, an Asian sister. And living in Chicago, life was really quite fabulous. But when I moved to a very provincial town in the South, we were um, quite literally almost slapped in the face um, with, with racism. Um, I, uh, I went and did my undergraduate work in uh, North Carolina at a school called Warren Wilson College. And Warren Wilson is one of 10 schools in um, higher education where the students manage the entire institution. We, own, we have our own operating farm and garden. Uh, we raise sheep um, for wool and looming and uh, raise our own cows and fruits and vegetables. It's, it's a very unique place. And all the students there are required to work 15 hours a week to sustain the college community. Upon graduation, I worked at the Smithsonian Institution's Museum of American Art during the United States Congress's Cultural War on the National Endowment for the Arts. And I was empowered to use my artistic voice to create opportunities for dialogue and to address modern day concerns. This is during the height of the AIDS pandemic and I was volunteering at Whitman Walker Clinic uh, with people with AIDS as a buddy and also doing some queer social justice work with the Human Rights Campaign and also in the streets with ACT UP uh, to bring national and global attention to the HIV AIDS crisis. In my work as an artist and in this exhibition, I, I really want to encourage viewers to reflect on social justice, um, environmental issues, and the lives and faces people may be unfamiliar with, while encouraging the viewer to think about their own privilege and how they might affect change. Um, the act of sewing is stitched throughout my work, um, and I do that very quite intentionally because Historically, sewing has been labeled as women's work. And as a gay cisgendered man, um, I really want to encourage the viewer to question privilege. What is valued work and how does it fit in a global context? Just as women's work has lost cultural currency, I want to emphasize the power and the importance of our collective in history and our history to understand our collective truth and our social constructs. And so uh, the show gives a, a taste of some of those images of people I've worked with around the planet. Um, back in the 80s, I, I wrote down 10 to 12 pages of all the things I might want to do the rest of my life. And one of those um, was whatever age I was is how many countries I would have been to on the planet Earth. So 20 years old, 20 countries, 40 years old, 40 countries, and so on. And it's not about just going to a country. It's about living and working with the people. And my focus is looking at indigenous people and folks that are some of the poorest of the poor. And um, so when I did sabbatical work uh, from the university, I was working, my last sabbatical was in Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, Malaysia, Borneo, and Bangladesh. And um, I take images and working with people in community and work with elders and youth. And I then document some of that experience um, in my stitch work, photography, and mixed media images that I have in this exhibition. Fantastic. Thank you, Greg. That's You're welcome. Some work definitely with social justice and, you know, recognizing everyone in the world, you know, all these different communities. It's, it's no small task, right? Um, thank you for sharing. Uh, let's move on to Aubrey. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your work. Hey, so much. Um, so, uh, hi from Los Angeles. Um, really excited to be here. Thank you guys so much. Um, I, for this show, I have a series of drag portraiture based on um, drag queens and drag performers that I met and uh, was friends with during my time living in Atlanta, Georgia. I was there for 10 years um, before moving to California. And this, this uh, series was kind of created in a time of flux for me. Um, it was the end of 2017, beginning of 2018, and I was invited to, pr to um, participate in a show at Kennesaw State University in Georgia. Um, 
And the curator was interested in drag portraiture work that I had done while I was in Atlanta. And um, I asked if I could do a new set uh, and do new portraiture uh, or new portraits. And um, it was a period, uh, it was kind of just past the year mark of moving to Los Angeles. And so this project was really a beautiful way to kind of still connect with the community, the queer community in Atlanta that, you know, I was there for 10 years. This was a place that my art really expanded. And um, I realized that I wanted to be an artist kind of full time. And um, so, and these relationships with these queens were really personal as well. Um, uh, while I was, in Atlanta for, for eight of those years, I lived with a drag queen. Uh, and the portraits that I did at the time, it, 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 it offered me a unique way to participate in the scene um, since I did not do drag. Uh, and um, by being able to serve as documentation, audience, supporter, uh, puppeteer, um, uh, dry ice special effects uh, assistant. Um, what else did I do? Uh, I, I was kind of given a lot of weird roles. But um, anyway, uh, it was a really great project to, to be invited to, to create this work. And it was so great to work with these queens from across the country to create these portraits. Um, it made me feel a little less homesick. Um, it made the transition across the coast a little easier. Um, and there's also something about Atlanta drag that is just fantastic. If you can ever go see a drag show in Atlanta, Georgia, once all this craziness is over, do it. It's some of the best drag in the world. Um, it really is. And I mean, Los Angeles has some of the biggest drag queens living here and it's incredible to see shows here too. Um, but Atlanta, Georgia is a special place. Uh, and these queens have a special place in my heart. So um, anyway, I picked there's, there's three queens in this show, but the series has seven total. Um, and I worked off of photos that I'd taken of the queens during uh, my time. So I kind of went through my archives, um, except for the one of Dax. The one with Dax, uh, I worked off of a, a selfie that she had taken. Uh, but I worked with them going back and forth with the templates. Um, I remember Hydrangea Heath being particularly, uh, um, have many notes uh, <laughs> about eye color, beard color, all of these things, which was kind of hilarious. But, um, but you don't want to mess up a drag queen's portrait. You really don't. They, uh, they don't like that. <laughs> um, anyway, um, yeah, it was a really great series. And um, these three queens are, you know, so inspiring. I mean, to be honest, Dax exclamation point is, probably one of the reasons why I moved to Atlanta in the first place. Um, I was down visiting my sister, Hester, and uh, before I moved down there, she, she's lived down there for, for many years. And, um, and we went out to um, this fabulous gay club called Mary's. And um, I just remember seeing Dax, I, I, I had no idea who she was. And she was on top of the bar dancing in high heels and just holding court. And I was just like, at the time I lived in Providence, I was in school, um, and I had not seen queer community like this, and it just felt like home. Um, and so it quickly became my home, and um, yeah, Georgia still kind of feels a little like home um, in a lot of ways. It just, it's that kind of place. Um, but um, yeah, and uh, Hydrangea Heath is an incredible artist in, um, in his, her own right. Um, was, um, went to SCAD and was a printmaker and had years ago had done these amazing prints that kind of used cross stitch, um, but printed. Uh, and that blew me away. And so we've been um, kind of close ever since then. And, um, and Bitch Pudding is just fantastic. Um, and Bitch Pudding actually is one of the queens that has left Georgia and now lives in Los Angeles. Uh, she was the winner of season two of Dragula. Uh, which is a great show on Netflix if you haven't seen it. Um, and she also does a Twitch drag show on Fridays. Uh, it's kind of gone to like twice a month, but once quarantine hit, um, they started this, they were one of the first to do these online Twitch drag shows, which have become very popular. It's a little super saturated at this point, but it's called Digital Drag and Bitch Pudding is amazing. And um, 
I'm so thankful that she is in Los Angeles, even though um, we can't really see each other right now. But, um, uh, but yeah, yeah. That's fantastic. Wow, thank you for sharing. Um, this kind of leads me to, and I know a couple of you have already started to answer this question, but um, referencing the body in portraiture, why do it? Have you worked abstractly and why did you lean one way as opposed to the other way? Anyone can jump in, but feel free. In my work, I use the idea of body both literally and figuratively. Um, in this show, I do body as a person, but also body as in water. Um, I focus on the body as person to tell story and to honor the lives of the people that I encounter, uh, particularly with indigenous communities living in developing nations, usually making less than $2 a day, and oftentimes working in occupations that most people wouldn't want to work in, particularly sweatshops um, and the global hunger for fast fashion. And, and then also my work is uh, with, figuratively with the, the idea of water, is to honor the spirit of water as healer, um, as ritual and life force. You know, our bodies are mostly water. The earth is 71% water. The oceans hold 96% of all water. Um, and yet we, we live, have lived with our mother earth for 6 million years. And in our current evolution, we are destroying her. Um, and then also the idea that the average person on the street has no idea where their water really comes from um, because they turn on the faucet and or go to the supermarket and see it on the shelf. But the, the water has many colors to it, depending as to where it comes from. Um, and the idea too that water is life, um, women create life, and yet we devalue both water and women and they are the core to humanity's existence. And without them, we're, we're all at risk. So we are water and our destinations are all intertwined. So that's how I kind of consider the idea of body, be it either in a figurative way or in a literal way. That's great. Thank you for mentioning that, Greg, because in comparison to all the artists here on the panel today, you do have more figurative representational work, but you do also have um, a more abstract, I can't remember the name of the piece, but it has a lot of beadwork layering with different fabrics and beads and threads, things like that. And uh, yeah, thank you for referencing the body and, uh, and water. I think that's a really great comparison because I know I don't know where necessarily where my water comes from, but <laughs> now maybe I kind of want to, I want to look into it now at this point. Um, did anyone else have any other thoughts regarding uh, body portraiture, um, abstract versus uh, figure? Um, I can jump in. Um, so I think that for me, it was very much a, a exploration and curiosity about queer pasts through photography, uh, magazines, uh, physique pictorials, um, going through significant um, mid 20th century to end of 20th century eras through those ephemeral, um, enjoy, very enjoyable paper works um, to, to see what that queer lineage looks like. Um, and then bringing it, and that is through bodies, right? Um, that is expli explicitly through bodies, might be through clothing, it might through, be through posture as well. Um, and I think at this moment, since there's less of that ephemera to put one's hands on, but there's more queer self-representation, right? Because people are putting up Instagrams and, and um, however else they're putting up a lot of selfies and putting their bodies out there. Um, now it's a little bit more following the thread of self-representation, which is a tremendously different, um, different approach. Um, so I think in both cases, it's looking at how representation of bodies has changed through the eras and, and how does that bring us, what does that look like in our present day? I would chime in and say that, uh, you know, I think that often I think about my work as being about the absence of a body, right? Like there's a, a deliberate emptiness to the garments, a, a missing person. Uh, but one of the things that, that I will say is that 
I'm really, as a collagist, very interested in the depiction of people. Uh, and I often sort of queer art history. I had this great piece that was shown in Rome Art Week this past fall, which was kind of a queer Venus rising. Uh, and I spent a lot of time thinking about what uh, what a kind of a queer goddess figure would be like. Uh, I'm also really interested in sort of dismantling my own use of human imagery that is um, specifically raced and thinking much more consciously about what as a white person um, I can or shouldn't be using in terms of, of the imagery that I work with. I'll just say that that's something that I think is a deep dive right now. And uh, so I've maybe been a, um, in the moment kind of avoiding human depiction a little bit while I kind of come to some clearer understanding of what I think is, is mine to share. Uh, but I've started off with kind of a, a queering of art history as, as, a, as the lens into that work. Uh, yeah, you can see uh, my, my Venus figure there, a, a scrap left over from the, from the, from the, um, the bigger piece that I used in this, in this uh, queer descendant garment. Uh, to speak quickly back with um, Greg, what you were saying about water and um, um, I mean, certainly Los Angeles has a very complicated relationship historically and currently with water. Um, I've been rewatching the film Chinatown recently working on a piece based on it. And so I, I, I hear you on all of those um, points. I, it made me also think of um, when you talk about bodies of water, bodies of people, also just the fluidity, right? And speaking to that and fluidity of gender. And um, as we have, as a culture, come to really understand this a little more. Um, uh, I've, I've, earlier this summer was doing a series um, based on um, men in red Speedos kind of in front of beaches, hot tubs, pools. Um, which references certainly, Rebecca, when you talk about uh, physique pictorial, for me, I'm referencing like um, uh, universal, ma uh, universal mail, what am, uh, international mail uh, catalogs, which would you know show up in the mail at my house growing up and I would like pull them out quickly and hide them and be like, uh, <laughs> uh, how did we get this? <laughs> um, but uh, there's also, uh, the water really references uh, sexuality, sex, um, and uh, it's just, it's interesting to hear um, what, how water kind of plays into to your work, Greg, and how it has similar and also kind of different references. Um, and then also just how water for the world is gonna continue to be a huge issue, whether it's flooding or droughts or fires, or just access. Um, so it's, it's interesting to see that kind of permeating and um, becoming more, more and more a part of things, and whether it's in the background or foregrounds of work. Um, and uh, Sylvan, to, to, to kind of what you were saying about, about really thinking about the body right now, um, I really hear you about that. And coming out of a period of doing a lot of figurative work and really kind of thinking about um, both representation and, um, you know, the, the, the right to create a portrait of someone. Um, I mean, my work in this show, it, it was all discussed and talked about and they were a part of the process. But um, the swimsuit series that I did, uh, similar to what Rebecca was talking about with, with her tumbler bears and, you know, sometimes there's an interaction, but sometimes there isn't. Um, and I think it's really beautiful what you were saying about kind of uh, selfies and people and queer bodies being documented in by selves and um, you're kind of documenting that and um, establishing that is important. Um, and there's something about stitching something that uh, for me kind of elevates beyond a uh, kind of a, a scrolling imagery that is that seems very ephemeral and um, yeah so I uh, just wanted to, to add that. Absolutely and thinking about ephemeral and like losing the ability to be able to feel something 
you know, physically at this point in time is, is very different and very difficult. I'm sure for all of you working in textiles and, and fiber art, um, you haven't lost the connection to fiber yourself, but maybe um, losing the chance in, in some cases, I'm sure, to be able to display that to other people, you know, because it's, it's got to be a little bit difficult to get a ton of exhibitions out there. Being able to just share, you know, cloth or an object with another person is a whole nother thing. Um, I wanted to ask everyone, um, why textiles? Why fiber art? Um, what, what brought you to this path of fiber art? And during this discussion, I also want to talk about scale. And uh, thinking about portraiture, for example, one of Greg's pieces is larger than life, close to the face. Um, I can't quite remember the name of the piece, but then we also have Aubrey's, which is maybe a little bit smaller than person-sized. I'd love to hear what everyone has to say regarding figures, portraiture, along with um, textiles and fibers. And if you're ready, I'd love to start with Greg with this question. Sure. Um, it's interesting you know, how textile, we're, we're all engaged it when you basically pop out of the womb and you get wrapped up in the swaddling clothes, right? Um, but we really don't think of it being engaged because it's just something that's on us and with us. Um, I didn't really come really thoughtful about being truly engaged as textile, except when, when I um, was nine years old. And um, I come from a family of sisters. And um, when I was nine years old, um, they were learning how to crochet and I really wanted to pick it up and I did it better than they did and they got frustrated and I just, I just loved it. And I didn't think there was anything really peculiar about it. I thought that's just what families did. Um, and that ev evolved um, into cross stitch, costuming and drag performance when I was in elementary school. Um, and this is back in the seventies. Um, and middle school, high school, as well as college. And, and when I was doing, um, working with fiber, even in those days, um, you know, I, I, I moved to Florida, um, I got harassed and bullied for it. Um, I got beaten up almost every single day and it was quite awful. Um, but I didn't, I didn't run away from it. I embraced it. Um, and on Halloween, watch out. I was always going to jump on it because I was, a very much a crafter. Um, but when it came to, um, into my evolution more as an idea of art, um, it wasn't until I was in college. And uh, when I started painting on canvas, and then also started making paper um, with uh, fiber that we had um, in the forest and on the farm and so on. But when I was doing my work, um, I was very traditional and it felt like something was missing um, from my work. Um, fast forward, um, uh, 2018, I was um, now living on the West um, in uh, Washington State, teaching at the university, and also my boyfriend was in, in Idaho, and my position was cut, um, and I moved out onto his farm. Um, it's several thousand acres wheat farm. And I, st I was continuing to paint um, of the, the, the Snake River. And um, I, I chose to leave the farm in 2000, late 2008, um, because if I was gonna get snowed in, I was, had no way to interview for jobs. Moved back to my house in Miami. And again, I was just really missing my boyfriend. So I ended up stitching um, into the canvas um, wheat, um, shafts of wheat, um, and also then beading um, kernels. And it was a way of telling story and connecting um, a, a love relationship that was no longer, um, but it kept me connected to him. And then when I moved um, to uh, Minnesota, um, I had uh, put my, uh, a piece into a show. It was actually a photography piece of, uh, of an image of a person that I was, I'd met and did some work with in India, in Varanasi. And the, the image was fantastic, but the curator um, cut the image, the juror cut the image. And like most of us, we're our own worst critics. And I got home and I cut my photograph up and I was just down and out about me as an artist. And I was like, is this direction? How do I tell my story? And I was like, oh my God, I just threw away this piece of photography and all this money because it was a big image. So I collected all these scraps of these, of these pieces 
and I started gluing them in a larger format onto a canvas. And then in order to connect the image, I um, started painting um, from where the photograph was and connecting all these beats and pieces. And then it still felt kind of discombobulated. And I looked down on my hands because I'd been crying and I noticed um, all of the, my, my fingers and, and the, um, the texture of my hands because of the skin that I was in. And I looked into the mirror and I saw all these pores in my face as I wipe away the tears. And I was like, wow, that's what I need to be doing. I need to be stitching into the face of this, of this being and connecting fiber with the idea of pore in order to tell the story. Um, and long story short, I, I put that same image that didn't get into the show into another exhibition and a year later, that one best of show. And after that, I was hooked. And um, so ever since then, um, I've gotten some state arts boards grants, um, had several um, uh, solo shows, and people are really drawn to the, the larger images of portrait of indigenous people that I've worked with around the planet. And um, I'm doing another series right now with men with these amazing beards. When I was in Morocco and in India in Bangladesh, and some other places. And, um, and I'm doing some really neat stitch work within the beards. Um, so that's a little about how I got into fiber. And for me, fiber is a way of connecting the image that I could not do with paint and other forms and also basketry. Now I'm doing some other ideas of fab fiber and pulling it into work as well as doing some cross work between metal and um, fiber um, into piece and storytelling. So, I've gotten off on a tangent, but yes, it's, it's a way of me connecting my story, but then also with the images that I use, it's a way of celebrating the lives of the women in particular that I work with in developing countries because they are stitchers making garments, and I want to be able to highlight the work that they're doing to bring attention to sweatshops in, in global fast fashion. Absolutely. Wow. So not just fibers at this point or photography, you're looking into other mixed media as well. And I know a couple of you have also been working with mixed media, um, particularly Aubrey with playing with animations. Um, Aubrey, did you want to talk about that? Where, start, where you started with fibers and then going into maybe the technological standpoint? Sure, sure. So I guess for me, um, fiber goes back also to childhood for me. And I pulled these, I pulled all the shirts that were off them or that were on them so I could show you. But these were made by my grandmother, Grandma Emma Blavel, these coat hangers, and she did crochet. And my siblings and I all still have them. They're all different colors. Um, they're totally treasured. Um, and also every Christmas when she'd come to visit, uh, she would have crocheted little um, like booties for all of us. And I'm actually, I'm wearing the last ones. <laughs> Somehow they still fit uh, with my big old feet. Um, and um, so that was a super influence. And my mother worked in um, needlepoint, particularly um, during pregnancies. So there were a few kind of heirloom objects around the house. I'm, I'm the youngest of four, so by the time I was born, um, that was kind of the end of her crafting kind of period. But these, these objects remain in our family. Um, and I had one of a sampler that she had created above my bed in college. Um, uh, also, my eldest sister um, uh, works in home textiles. And so I, I have a, a lot of inspiration um, from women in my family. And that just was kind of all um, just kind of in the background for me. Uh, I was in school for animation um, when I really got into embroidery. Um, funny enough, uh, it was my sophomore year. Uh, and the, the way that my school worked was the first year was foundation. And so it was really beginning uh, my focus in animation. But it was pretty um, a kind of introductory period. Uh, and so I guess I had extra kind of creative impulses. And I was 
I had this kind of crazy rainbow net installation above my bed, you know, art school, right? And I had this amazing sampler that my mother had made um, there. And then um, I was listening a lot to this album, Joanna Newsom's Milk Eyed Men Mender. And the album art is made by Emily Prince. Sorry, the glare is horrible. Um, but just seeing kind of examples of embroidery um, in the world, um, just kind of they got me excited about it and I just started doing it um, really just like into them try different things and I would do it uh, kind of as a similar to sketchbook practice um, at the time my group of friends you know at the end of the day you would all hang out and everyone would have their sketchbook and you draw on their sketchbook you write in yours like everyone's just kind of hanging out so it's a similar thing where I would have this canvas and I would just you know, start working and um, uh, it just kind of continued as a practice for me um, and seeing um, seen uh, um, um, uh, pricked extreme embroidery at the Museum of um, Art and Design in New York uh, was a really important uh, moment for me. Um, I was visiting um, my other sister, Vanessa, who I think is here, shout out. Um, and she lived in New York at the time and I went down to visit, I was still in school and I went to see this museum and I was just blown away. I mean, there were there were two examples in that show that artists had incorporated new media with with um, kind of textiles uh, practices. Um, one with a zoetrope, and the other um, using a, kind of a machine stitching that would stitch the line between um, America and Mexico. Um, and overall, this this show is just if anyone caught it, like. It's incredible. I wish I had the book for it. I lent it to someone and it goes to show you should never lend people your favorite books. Um, but that was a super big inspiration. And then also another great book, uh, Art and Queer Culture. But um, the work of Nicholas Mouferge was really inspirational for me. Um, he didn't create a ton of work. He died really young, um, but what an incredible artist. Um, and then after graduating, uh, moving down to Atlanta, um, this, the art scene there was um, experimental, cost of living was cheap, which was great. So I could just, and honestly, my, um, my, my embroidery practice just blossomed. Um, um, people responded to it. Uh, and I, at that point, I was able to connect kind of these two passions for the first time with this piece, kind of above me, you can see part of it. It's a 14 frame animation of, um, of my roommate's dog, Gus, uh, who I lived with for many years. Um, the same drag queen that I lived with, it was, it was their dog, Gus, who was a stray that um, uh, he and an ex found um, on Memorial Boulevard and coerced into their car with a slice of bacon and um, they were at brunch or something and I think they asked the waiter like oh can we have some bacon we want to save this dog and it Gus was not in a good shape at that point no collar kind of really skinny um, and I, I I'd been wanting to, to to combine animation and embroidery ever since I started doing embroidery and was in school for animation and fellow animation students would recommend, oh, you should like do something with that. And for anyone that's done embroidery or animation, they are both extremely time consuming practices. So I remember just thinking like, you're crazy. Okay, sounds good. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, and I also enjoyed at the time that embroidery uh, was personal. It was like just something for me. It wasn't really for school. Um, and so I kind of liked that they were separate. Um, and I, while I was in school, I did do one kind of flip book thing that was like stitched frames, very small. And I, I did do kind of one thing. So, so, so Runaway, this piece wasn't the very first, but this was the real kind of first time that it, it, it became a, a, real, a real piece. Uh, I was bartending at this 
at this, I, no, I wasn't even bartending. I was working as a waiter at this gay bar in Atlanta, making no money. Oh my God, it was like no money. And I was just going home and stitching this for five months. It took five months to create. Um, I based it off a video that I, I got of my roommate to get Gus running back and forth in the backyard. And then I created this loop and then I separated it into three colors and then started stitching frame number one. And when I was on frame number two, I realized that the back would still register, that even with the knots and ties and stuff, the movement would still kind of work. Um, which Rebecca, I love how you were talking and you often work with the backs of your pieces. And it's so interesting that so many textile and fiber artists are obsessed with the backs of their works. Um, and I totally hear you on that because it's there, I have many occasions where I'm like, should I frame it backwards? I kind of like it better backwards. Uh, and that's always really going, tough because it's- Oh, oh sorry, please. yeah, I was gonna mention the same thing between both Aubrey and Rebecca um, with the backs of the work and playing with that. Um, in the interest of time, we do have a question in the chat room. Um, I'd like to start with both, both uh, Rebecca and Sylvan. Um, so the question is from Bren Ahern, actually, who's uh, someone who's also in the show. Uh, would you all talk about your other bodies of work, um, specifically Rebecca's flower beards, Aubrey's animation, Sylvan's Gaze Against Guns, and Greg's smaller works, any relation to the work in the show? Pretty much comparing the work you have in the Pride show in comparison to uh, some of the work that's on your website, particularly the ones mentioned. So um, Rebecca, if you could uh, start out with your flower beards, that would be fantastic. Sure. Um, hold on a second. Let me just grab one. Um, this might be an example of a flower beard. Um, so it's much more intricate um, in terms of a, a embroidery perspective than the than um, some of the body portraiture work. Um, I think honestly, I just wanted to expand. I, I can't. I can't draw a, like an exact line from the pieces in the show to the flower beards, but I wanted, oh, I know where to expand. All right, so I'm a self-taught embroidery artist, um, and I literally uh, didn't really know what I was doing when I started. Um, and I only used like pearl cotton for everything. So I was trying to shade with pearl cotton, um, like including the pieces that are in the, in the show. Um, which is really hard. Um, it's, you can't do thread painting, you can't do the kind of detail. And I think somehow it just, the message got through, Rebecca, it's time to try this six strand thread. It actually, you can do what you've been dreaming of for several years. <laughs> um, and when I realized that, I really wanted to explore flowers because um, flowers as a traditional motif made a lot of sense to me and you can just do do wild color experimentation. A lot of my earlier work, I was really limiting myself to a, a very constrained color palette, almost like if you were doing traditional print, like printmaking, you would only have a couple of passes. You know, you'd have to limit your color palette. That was almost the approach I was taking with my uh, embroidery. And so this was just like a bursting forth. Like I've got the th different kinds of threads, thin, fat, whatever. Um, I can do any color I want. I always could do any color I want, but I was constraining myself. Um, and uh, because um, bears are really my focus for the last several years, it made a ton of sense. It was like, oh yes. And beards were kind of like, not as quite as uh, omnipresent when I started doing them. So it's also like, ooh, look at beards. Now, you know, it's like, so what? <laughs> but um, celebrating beards, celebrating kind of bare masculinity, um, celebrating color uh, and tying in that masculinity with that traditional flower uh, motif was just um, really uh, burst things open for me and, and, and was, was very joyous and, and a tremendous relief. Um, on a side note, I was talking with the artists earlier before this started about how I feel like I'm in dialogue with people I am in with sh in shows and a lot of the pieces um, that I've done more recently with flower beards are often other artists like this is an artist who was in the clear queer thread show um, a lot of uh, quite a lot of the pieces that I do are, are of artists that I've been in shows with 
um, or who are artists I'm in communication with online. So that's like another level. That, that artist is uh, Peter Hawking. Uh, who works out of Provincetown, for instance. So that makes it more fun, more intimate. You're spending a lot of time with these people you're doing portraits of, portraits of as any of us can attest. Like, it's like a short term, it's a long term relationship in the short term. So like really loving the people that you're making portraits of, that's Cupid. Um, it makes it extra fun and extra personal and extra community oriented. Absolutely. Wow, yeah, I'm gonna have to look at those more now. I'm just, the colors are fantastic and everything. Thank you so much. Um, let's jump over to Sylvan for the one final question. I know it's almost one, but please stick with our, for our viewers. Um, Sylvan, if you could talk about um, Gays Against Guns specifically, that work, and um, yeah. how it refers to the work you have on the show. So, um, you know, I, I'm a, a, an activist in Gays Against Guns uh, and actually am working currently on a, a memorial garment and a return to wearing clothing that will be worn by an activist. Uh, and I am uh, uh, archiving all of the names of the uh, people who've been killed by gun violence, whose personal stories I've researched and shared as part of my work for Gays Against Guns. I, moder I co-moderate. Um, the Human Beings ga Gag uh, Facebook page, which is sort of like a, an AIDS memorial inspired site, uh, telling the stories about uh, people who've been killed by gun violence. And, you know, there are, you know, 70,000 people, Americans killed uh, since the start of the, of the new year. Uh, and I'm, I've told, I think, 80 stories, uh, right? So researching, sharing, I often hear from, uh, from families that they are amazed that someone who had never met their loved one is helping hold um, their story, their name. I, we try to do so with, with reverence and honor. You can imagine that um, some of our work is specifically about the Black trans women uh, who are disproportionately victimized uh, by gun violence uh, and an often misgendered or uh, dead named in the account of their stories. So that's really important. Uh, and I'll just mention that I was interviewed uh, as a gay as against guns activist for a recent show, uh, Arms, Arm Disposal, that uh, Erica Diamond and Bren were uh, who are in this show were in in New York, and I got a chance to go see their work in person for the first time, and just sort of uh, talk about the relationship between these artists I'm in I'm in this show with and their work around gun violence and my activism personally around gun violence as a member of Gays Against Guns, uh, and uh, I think that one of the things that I'll say is that you know the use of textile and garments as memorial or remembrance work i think is really um gener is you know generations and generations and i'm uh, and i think of myself a portion of my work as being in that category it's a, it's an active um activism as much as it's an active memorial or remembrance That's fantastic. Um, yeah, and I'm I'm carrying I'm I'm in this photo on on the Women's March. I'm uh, to the left, and I believe I'm carrying a photo of Chanel Skurlock. Um, uh, but it's hard to read from here. Uh, but the snow started to come down on us. We were the end of the march. You can see um, uh, the rows of police officers um, not so nicely following behind us. Uh, and I'll also mention that I you know I often carry. Um, uh, signs with the names of black transgender women killed over the course of the year and Black Lives Matter marching in New York right now, you know, crossing the you know, Brooklyn Bridge with 15,000 people. And, I, and I'm very much carrying the stories of this work and activism with honor, with remembrance uh, to, to try to counter the, the, um, the tremendous epidemic of, of gun violence in, in our country. Such important work, Sylvan. Thank you for thank you for sharing. Yeah, with everything going on and all these what Chicago and Portland, all of this is super pertinent and needs to be talked about. Um, in the interest of time, it is 102. Thank you all so much for joining us today. If you do have any more questions, like Robin, I see in the group chat had a quick question. We will get back to you. We will reach out to the artists. In the meantime, I strongly encourage everyone who can and feels comfortable enough doing so to try to come in for a scheduled appointment into Textile Center so you could check out this amazing pride show in the flesh. Um, otherwise, we do have a virtual exhibition that was linked um, coinciding with this discussion. 
Um, thank you again for coming. And artists, thank you so much for joining today and talking about your work. Um, if you have any questions, please reach out. And uh, thanks again.